Welcome, and thank you all for being here. For those of you who do not know me, I am Eddie Weeks, your legislative librarian. Your legislative library is just across the hall here. In suite 804, please stop by and say hi at any time. I'm there to answer just about any historical question you may have about the legislature, old laws, past legislators, prior legislation, the legislative process, and even what is the story of the founding of the state of Tennessee? What a great question, and what great timing for that question, because 226 years ago, on July the 4th, 1796, Governor John Sevier sent a circular to the members of the first General Assembly of the state of Tennessee, calling them into an extraordinary session on July 30th, 1796, which lasted until August 9th, and giving them the news that the legislation creating the state of Tennessee had been approved by the United States Congress and signed into law by President George Washington the preceding month on June the 1st, 1796. That legislation had only been passed by the fourth Congress of the United States the day before that on May 31st, 1796, which was the next to last day of the first session of that Congress before they adjourned for the year. Now think about that. The fourth Congress adjourned for the year on June the 1st, 1796, and did not meet again until December 1796. Now, we all know what the last few days of session are like, and they admitted a new state into the Union on their next to last day of their session. And that bill only passed that Congress because of certain agreements and concessions. The main concession being that Tennessee would have two senators, but only one representative in Congress. In the second session of that Congress, which would begin in December 1796, Tennessee became the 16th state of the Union and the first state that had previously been a territory of the United States. And that moment, the creation of the state of Tennessee with its 11 counties in two groups separated by Cherokee lands out of the territory south of the River Ohio is the end of the story I'm about to tell you on the founding of the state of Tennessee, focusing primarily on the governments that were created in this land. Now, let's start our story back in 1763. Yes, 1763, before the United States, way before the state of Tennessee. We could have started even earlier with Christopher Columbus, the Dutch East India Company, and all the exploration. But let's start instead in 1763. Remember, these were not Americans. They're British subjects living in British colonies all along the East Coast. What would later be Tennessee was in French territory, Louisiana. 1763 was the year of the Treaty of Paris, which ended the French and Indian War, which was French colonists joining forces with these Native Americans to fight against these British colonists. In this treaty, France surrendered control of its lands east of the Mississippi River to Britain and what would become Tennessee became British land. But also in 1763, King George III, remember these are British subjects, King George III issued the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which forbade British colonists from settling west of the Allegheny and Appalachia Mountains in this newly acquired British land. On this map, west of the Appalachia is called reserved country. It was reserved for the Native Americans who were already living there. British colonists were not allowed to live there 
from the mountains to the Mississippi River, including the land that would become Tennessee. So you have 13 British colonies from the East Coast to the Appalachia, reserved country from the mountains to the river, and still French Louisiana west of the Mississippi River. But not all of those British colonists agreed with that royal proclamation, and some of them just wandered on the other side of the mountains west of North Carolina, settling in this reserved country in what would later become Tennessee. They would especially settle along the Watauga River in what's now northeast Tennessee. And in 1772, those settlers, about 70 farms and homesteads, established the Watauga Association, the first government in what would become Tennessee. Now, before I go on, yes, there were Native American tribes already here with their own form of governance. And before the Royal Proclamation of 1763, this area was under French control and they presumably had some form of governance. But this, the Watauga Association, was the first government in what would become Tennessee with a written process for, for conducting the business of government. McGee's A History of Tennessee, first published in 1899, explains that the men from Wolf's Creek, Carter's Valley, Watauga, and Nolichucky elected 13 men to make laws suited to the needs of the new settlements. The Committee of 13 was a legislative body, the first in what would become Tennessee. Theodore Roosevelt, in The Winning of the West, wrote, they decided to adopt written articles of agreement by which their conduct should be governed, and these were known as the Articles of the Watauga Association. They formed a written constitution, the first ever adopted west of the mountains, or by a community composed of American-born freemen. It is this fact of the early independence and self-government of the settlers along the headwaters of the Tennessee that gives to their history its peculiar importance. They were the first men of American birth to establish a free and independent community on the continent. And not everyone was happy about this. In 1774, the Earl of Dunmore the royal governor of Virginia wrote to the Earl of Dartmouth, the British Secretary of State for Colonial Affairs, remember these are British colonists living in British colonies, and I'm sorry, there's only one way I can do this. <clears throat> in effect, we have an example of the very case, there being actually a set of people in the back part of the colony, bordering on the Cherokee country, who, finding they could not obtain the land that they fancied under any of the neighboring governments, have settled upon it without, and contented themselves with, becoming a matter tributary to the Indians, and have appointed magistrates, and framed laws for their very present occasions, and to all intents and purposes, erected themselves into, though an inconsiderable, yet a separate state the consequences of which may prove hereafter detrimental to the peace and security of the other colonies. It at least sets a dangerous example to the people of America of forming governments distinct from and independent of His Majesty's authority. <laughs> the British Crown was taking notice of this Committee of Thirteen who were still British subjects. McGee's History of Tennessee also lists the members of the Committee of 13 as of 1776, and their names read like a partial list of the counties of Tennessee, Carter, Robinson, Sevier, Smith, but it was a government with a clerk and an attorney and an unknown sheriff. And this year, 
the 112th General Assembly of the State of Tennessee adopted 2022 Senate Joint Resolution 1506 commemorating the Watauga Association on their 250th anniversary. Meanwhile, back in 1775, a few hundred miles to the east of the Watauga Association, those British colonies along the East Coast were now in revolt. The American Revolution had begun. On April 19, 1775, the first shots for the War of American Independence are fired in Lexington and Concord, Massachusetts. The next year, July the 4th, 1776, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. A new nation joined the world stage, and those 13 colonies became 13 states. The Watauga Association then renamed their land the Washington District in honor of General George Washington and voted themselves indebted to the United Colonies for their share of the general expenses of the Revolutionary War. The problem was the Watauga Association or the Washington District was still in British territory and not in a state of the United States. But that didn't stop the Watauga Association from petitioning the North Carolina legislature to annex them into that state. In 1777, the General Assembly of the State of North Carolina created Washington County out of the late District of Washington. There was now county government in what would later become Tennessee, but it was a North Carolina county. 27 justices of the peace took office to serve that county, and their names give us more county names of Tennessee, including Robertson County, named for James Robertson. James Robertson, though, decided to leave Washington County and seek new land. In 1779, he and a few friends set up Fort Nashboro along the Cumberland River in what's now Middle Tennessee. By the next year, in May of 1780, there were around 250 men living in the area in seven different stations or forts. And in May 1780, they decided that they needed their own government. And Richard Henderson, one of the men living there, wrote up the Cumberland Compact. This document created a representative form of government with courts and taxation. The men were governed by a tribunal of notables, 12 men elected to lead the colony and settle disputes. The year before this, in 1779, the North Carolina legislature had split Washington County into Sullivan and Washington counties. Two counties of North Carolina in what would later become Tennessee, plus the citizens living under the Cumberland Compact in the far west around what's now Nashville. The problem was all of this land was still technically in British territory. That changed in 1783. In 1783, in the Treaty of Paris, formally ending the American Revolution, 
Great Britain surrendered control of its remaining lands in North America, south of Canada, to that new nation. Florida was still Spanish territory. Everything west of the Mississippi River was still French Louisiana. But those 13 states now stretched from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River. And in 1783, the North Carolina legislature created Davidson County and Greene County in their western lands. North Carolina was now responsible for everything from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River, including those four North Carolina counties using 18th century technology. In 1784, North Carolina ceded its western lands to Congress and gave Congress two years to respond. The residents of this western territory were now no longer part of North Carolina, but they were not a part of any other state either. But they had also ended their self-government when they became part of North Carolina. In August 1784, some of those residents met in Jonesboro and made a decision. They would apply for statehood. In November 1784, a constitutional convention met and created the state of Franklin. In January 1785, John Sevier was elected their governor, and the land that would become Tennessee had its first state governor and its first state government. This, the state of Franklin, would be the 14th state of the United States. The problem was North Carolina had repealed their cession of the land to the United States. The state of Franklin was actually still a part of the state of North Carolina. And to make this clear, in 1788, the state of North Carolina created Tennessee County and Davidson County in their western lands, which was also the first time that the name Tennessee would be used on land that would become the state of Tennessee. So the state of Franklin was inside the state of North Carolina. Now, just imagine that one day Memphis just decided to become its own state and elected their own governor and elected their own legislature and paid all of their taxes to the state of Memphis instead of the state of Tennessee. How do you think the rest of the state would respond? The state of Franklin, though, the state of Franklin still had a chance if Congress would recognize this new state. But now there was infighting. There were two groups. The Franklin Party, led by the elected governor of the state of Franklin, John Sevier, who wanted the state of Franklin to exist, and the North Carolina Party, led by John Tipton. Now, John Tipton had been in favor of statehood for the state of Franklin until John Sevier was elected governor of the state of Franklin instead of John Tipton. <laughs> At that point, he decided it would be much better to remain part of North Carolina. And John Tipton got himself appointed as colonel of the militia for Washington County, North Carolina, which was also known as the state of Franklin. In Tennessee, its growth and progress, Dr. Robert H. White wrote that the state of Franklin and the state of North Carolina both made laws and appointed officers for this land, as though the other government did not exist at all. A strange situation developed, a people being under two different governments. The result was much ill feeling and dissatisfaction. But the state of Franklin did form. The people had their own governor, John Sevier, and their own legislature, and their own constitution, and their own government. We often think of the state of Franklin as a failed state. It wasn't. It had a constitution, 
It had a governor. It had a legislature. It had a government. The only thing it didn't have was the recognition of the United States government. This is Joseph Purcell's 1792 map of the United States, showing, interestingly enough, West Florida and East Florida. But what's most interesting, if we zoom in, okay, if we zoom way in, we see the new state of Franklin inside the state of North Carolina. It was a state with all aspects of state government, but was never recognized by the federal government. But the legacy of the state of Franklin continued. In 1803, the fifth General Assembly of the state of Tennessee passed an act to confirm all marriages solemnized under the authority of what was called the state of Franklin. Over a decade after this act, in 1815, the 11th General Assembly of the state of Tennessee passed an act to make good and lawful the probate and registrations that have heretofore been proven and registered under the laws of the state of Franklin. Franklin was a state, but was never recognized by the federal government. And John Sevier, governor of the state of Franklin, was arrested by the militia of North Carolina under the command of Colonel John Tipton for leading sedition and rebellion against that state. Meanwhile, in 1789, the state of North Carolina again ceded their western lands to the United States government, which this time accepted the land. Instead of accepting the state of Franklin, though, and its elected governor, John Sevier, the United States named the land the territory south of the River Ohio. And President George Washington appointed William Blunt as governor of the territory, ignoring the claim of John Sevier. In 1790, there were seven territorial counties in the territory south of the River Ohio. Green, Hawkins, Washington, Sullivan, Davidson, Sumner, and Tennessee counties. But none of these counties were inside a state. In 1791, the United States negotiated the Treaty of Holston with the Cherokee, setting the boundaries of this territory and of the Cherokee land. And in 1792, the territorial government created two more counties, Jefferson and Knox. But remember that the territorial govern government was just the appointed governor, William Blunt, and the appointed judges. There was no legislature for the territory. That changed in 1794. In 1794, the first territorial assembly convened in Knoxville and created the counties of Sevier and Blunt and divided their now 11 counties into three separate districts, Washington, Hamilton, and Merrow. And in 1794, the third United States Congress convened and the territory south of the River Ohio had its first United States representative, James White, but he was a non-voting member of that Congress as there was no state for him to represent. In 1795, that territorial assembly passed an act calling for the enumeration of the citizens of the territory south of the River Ohio to see if they had the 60,000 person threshold needed to apply for statehood. The result was nearly 80,000. And the government of the territory wasted no time. In February 1796, the Constitution of the State of Tennessee was adopted by unanimous consent of the Constitutional Convention 
held in Knoxville. The first election for members of the state legislature was held in early March, 1796. And on Monday, March 28, 1796, the first General Assembly of the state of Tennessee convened in Knoxville and recognized John Sevier as their governor. The state had a constitution, it had a governor, it had a legislature, it had a government. The only thing it didn't have was the recognition of the United States government. Meanwhile, on December 7th, 1795, the fourth United States Congress had convened. And day after day, month after month went by with no action being taken concerning the proposed state of Tennessee. In his book, Tennessee, Its Growth and Progress, Dr. Robert H. White wrote, although the new state of Tennessee had elected John Sevier as governor, William Blunt and William Cock as United States senators, and had established counties and elected various state officials, yet it was not in fact a state. The new state, Tennessee, had not been admitted to the Union, and over its admission to the Union, there was waged a bitter fight in Congress. That bitter fight was between the Federalists, who wanted a strong central government and executive branch led by President George Washington, and the Anti-Federalists, who wanted a weaker federal government and stronger states. And the Anti-Federalists thought that Tennessee would vote with the Federalists, and so wanted to keep Tennessee out of the Union at least until the next presidential election in November 1796. The United States House of Representatives was mostly in favor of statehood for Tennessee, but the U.S. Senate was not. Senators William Blunt and William Cock were not allowed to take their seats in the Senate as there was no state of Tennessee for them to represent. They instead basically worked as lobbyists, lobbying the Congress to accept the new state. Finally, in May 1796, in desperation, they offer a compromise. Tennessee would have only one representative in the U.S. House, giving the state only three electoral votes in Congress, the smallest number of any state beginning in the second session of the Fourth United States Congress, which would begin in December 1796. The compromise worked. Tennessee would have two senators, but only one representative in Congress. And on May 31st, the next to last day of the first session of the Fourth United States Congress, Congress passed an act for the admission of the state of Tennessee into the Union. And on June 1st, 1796, it was signed into law by President George Washington. Senators William Blunt and William Cock and Representative James White returned to Tennessee with the news. And so, on July 4th, 1796, Governor John Sevier sent a circular to the members of the first General Assembly of the state of Tennessee, calling them into their first extraordinary session and giving them the news that the time of the state of Tennessee had arrived. And ladies and gentlemen, that's all of my time. Thank you for your time.